Johnny Tremaine. Chapter 11, Part 5. Johnny almost forgot the principal reason for his visit to the lights. He would have liked to sit quietly for a moment, brood over what Miss Lavinia had told him. Now was not the time to brood. Scylla and Miss Betsy came back together. He told them he must have Pumpkin's uniform. Mrs. Betsy said he was not to think of such a thing. If they catch you, Johnny, they'll shoot you for impersonating a British soldier in wartime. Lots of better men got shot today, Lexington and Concord. The British are sending boats back and forth tonight, taking off their men from Charleston. I can sneak along over with them. No, I forbid you, Johnny. You're going to stay right here and help Chilla and me look after this house. I've got to go. Who's going to look out for the light horses if you walk out on us? General Gage has given his word no person or horse or any household gear will be touched, but we need a man to mind the stable. Johnny had an idea. Scylla, there's a thing you can do for me. What? Go to the Afric Queen and get my goblin. Take him here and turn him out to pasture with the light horses. I guess he won't mind being a Tory for a while. Can I ride him? Yes, if you don't mind falling off. I don't mind. She looked excited and pleased. Mrs. Betsy shook her head. And who's going to care for the animals? You adding your goblin makes things worse, not better for us two woman folk. The coachman's going with the lights? Of course, he's English born. Look here, Mr. Lorne, the printer. He's not what you'd call a coachman, but he was reared on a farm and he's in trouble. British haven't arrested him yet? He hid in a feather bed, but he can't stay there until we've driven the British out of Boston. Couldn't he and his wife and child move up here into the coachman's quarters? And you sort of act as though he had always worked there. Of course they could. I'd be proud to have them. Scylla, just as soon as the unicorn sails, you go to the Lorns and tell them to come right up and settle in. The girl nodded. Johnny said, if he can get this little press to working again... I think he might like to bring that with him. Go on with his sedition, as they call it. He just about has to print. We can hide his press, too. Nobody would dare hunt here for sedition, not after what Gage promised. He'll be a very happy man, and now I've got to go. Sill, where's that uniform of pumpkins? I hid it under my bed. I'll fetch it down. Mrs. Betsy shook her head, but she wasn't going to argue any more. How old are you, Johnny? she asked. Sixteen. And that's what? A boy or a man? He laughed. <laughs> a boy in time of peace and a man in time of war. Well, men have got to right to risk their lives for the things they think worth it. God go with you, my young man. If they shoot you, remember, I warned you. I'll remember all right. Pumpkin had been a little stouter than Johnny. The uniform went on easily over the boy's breeches and jacket. Mrs. Betsy braided his uniform for him and tied it tightly as the British regulars wore theirs. You couldn't say, could you? Chilla asked him. Why it is you have to get out tonight? Yes, Dr. Warren told me to. Told me things to watch for and report on to him. I've got to find him and Rab. Rab? The girl's voice sounded frightened. He was with the Lexington men. They stood up at dawn, and the regulars killed quite a few of them. Oh, but Rab? Johnny did not answer immediately. He was sitting at the kitchen table, and Mrs. Betsy was still fussing with his hair. Not once since Dr. Warren had left had he spoken his name. He hadn't dared to let himself begin thinking about him. If he did, he knew I could not think of anything else. Now he had spoken his name, and emotions, fears, that he had held in check all day surged up through him. But he said quietly, I've got to find him, so be a good girl, Sil, and mind Mrs. Betsy. He stood up 
and put on a shiny black hat with a silver cockade on it, and saluted smartly. He knew that the last men to wear this uniform had been shot for putting it off, and there was a chance he'd get shot for putting it on. The scarlet tunic with pale blue facings, the white crossband on the chest, the white breeches made him feel like a different person. Now he was a private of the king's own. He felt confident and happy. And Rab? Of course he was all right. You couldn't kill a fellow like Rab with just a handful of bullets. He shook hands with Mrs. Betsy, and because the uniform made him feel grown up, he kissed Scylla goodbye, just as he had the Sunday before seen Rab kiss his aunt. Not at all like a child being kissed by female relatives. But Scylla was mischievous. Why, I feel as if I were kissing Pumpkin. So Johnny stalked off down Beacon Hill with the proper martial strut. The littler they are, he thought, the more they strut. The physical act of strutting lifted his spirits, made him feel bigger than he was. Of course, that was why the little fellows do it. And he wondered what had happened to Sergeant Gale. And we'll start chapter 12 in the next video. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.